right, well, good morning, everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 20? And this morning, uh, we have been studying the resurrection of our Savior, and uh, we want to finish um, that subject, uh, but I want you to look at verse 11. So we start there, John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I don't know how big a woman Mary was. Mary Magdalene, I would imagine she was just a normal gal. Uh, wasn't any kind of a professional wrestler or anything like that. Um, I think Jesus was a fairly uh, good-sized guy. Well, he was a lumberjack. What do you mean? Well, he was a carpenter. But in those days, you didn't call Home Depot and have your wood delivered. You had to go out to the forest, cut it down, drag it back to the shop. So he was more along the lines of a lumberjack and uh, I think he was at least five eight five nine just a, at minimum um, so you know um, I kind of believe though if Jesus had died and they had taken his body somewhere if Mary could have found that body she would have picked it up and carried it uh, because I think that her love was that strong so verse 16 Jesus said to her Mary now we are at a loss because we cannot hear the inflection in people's voices in what they say as we read scripture but jesus said to her mary she turned and said to him rabboni which is to say teacher uh how was it that mary didn't recognize jesus by sight but knew him immediately when he spoke her name i mean she was not the only mary that followed jesus there were at least three or four other Marys, probably more is a very common name, uh, three or four that were mentioned in Scripture. Um, there were probably others that uh, had that name. And um, I believe Jesus had a way of saying the name of each of his disciples, especially the women, uh, the Marys especially, because there were so many. And... Um, there were, again, several Marys that followed him. How was it that this Mary knew her shepherd the moment he spoke her name? Well, Jesus had already given us the answer to that question earlier in his ministry. Turn to John 10. Let me read, starting with verse 1 out of the NLT, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognizes his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they do not know his voice. And so apparently Mary had turned away from Jesus thinking he was the gardener. But when he spoke her name, she recognized immediately that it was Jesus, uh, her shepherd, her king. And so she turned back to look into the eyes of her beloved master. And all she could say was Rabboni, which means my teacher. Now, Rabbi and Rabboni were equivalent terms of respect in Jewish culture. In later years, however, the Jews recognized three levels of teacher. Rab, which was the lowest, Rabbi, and then Rabboni was the highest. 
And Jesus' response to Mary has, I think, been misunderstood by many people. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, the King James translation comes across a little weird and uh, somewhat mystical. Let me read it to you. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I have not ascended to my Father. Commentators have picked up on that, and they have said, Well, see now, his glorified body was so holy that uh, a defiled human touching it would have defiled the body. Look, people say a lot of things. Let's stick to what the Bible says, okay? The Greek is better translated, Stop clinging to me. Look, we read in Matthew 28, verse 9, when the other gals that had come to prepare Jesus' body for burial that Sunday morning, um, when they saw the risen Lord, and they didn't see Jesus at the same time as Mary did. She was first. Then he appeared to these other gals, and Matthew tells they immediately fell on their faces, grabbed him by the ankles, and he never said to them, don't touch me. You're going to defile me. I haven't gone to my father yet. So what's going on here? Okay. What really is going on here? Well, one commentator said this. He said, and I quote, Why didn't Jesus want Mary to touch him? Actually, the ancient Greek construction of this phrase means, listen, to, <clears throat> to stop an action already begun rather than to avoid starting it. Mary was holding on to Jesus and did not want to let him go. Jesus was not protesting that Mary should not touch him lest he be defiled, but was admonishing her not to detain him because he would see her and the disciples again. And then I like what my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, said about this years ago. He said, it's my feeling that when Mary saw him, she probably got a death hold grip on around his neck and sort of said to him, you got away from me once. You're never going to get away from me again. I'll never let you go again. And in her excitement, in her thrill, I believe that she really just grabbed him and clung to him. And he said to her, Mary, stop clinging to me, uh, but go and tell my brethren that I'm ascending to my father and your father and my God and to your God. I think that's probably what was going on, right? Basically, he, she wanted to hold on to him all for herself. And he's saying, Mary, you got to let me go. I, 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 I got to be other people's savior as well, not just yours, all right? But she loved it. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, guys, the next, next section in John's gospel takes place Sunday evening. Sunday evening, the evening, Jesus rose from the dead. And there's some very important things that go on that evening in the upper room, things that we need to really understand, monumentally important things, spiritually speaking. But only Luke records what took place on that Resurrection Sunday afternoon. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time this morning looking at that passage devotionally, uh, not strictly expositionally, although we will go through it verse by verse. So turn to Luke 24. We have talked about this passage in the past, of course. But because we're studying the day Jesus rose from the dead, we've looked at the events that took place that morning. We're going to look in John's gospel what happened that evening, but only Luke records what went on in the afternoon with two disciples of Jesus. And so let's pick it up in verse 13, Luke 24. Now, behold, two of them were tra two of Jesus' disciples were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Let me stop there. So guys, here we have two of Jesus' disciples. They don't know he's risen from the dead. All they know is their Messiah, the one they had put all their hopes and dreams in, is dead. 
And this is the third day since he was crucified. And their hearts were set. Their spiritual passion had not only cooled, listen, it was all but gone. It was all but gone. First of all, before we try to determine what the problem was that was causing them to lose their spiritual passion, let's first look at what they hadn't lost, because that's important. What they had not lost, or in other words, what they still had in their relationship with Jesus. Verse 18. Then one of those whose uh, then one whose name was Cleopas answered uh, and said to him, uh, "Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem?" And have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And he, Jesus, said to them, what things? As if he was looking for information. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So what do these two disciples still have? Well, they still had a fondness for Jesus. That comes through in the passage, even though their hearts were broken and their dreams were shattered, they still spoke of Jesus with a fondness. Um, There really wasn't any bitterness in the way they spoke about him. In other words, they could have said something along the lines like, uh, you know, that Jesus, we put all our faith and trust in him, and he had to keep aggravating the, the, the Jewish leadership. And he got himself crucified. We're so upset with him. No, they nothing like that, right? Look, there's a lot of Christians who, when things don't go their way or their dreams are shattered in some way, that they become bitter against God, even angry. I've met them. I've seen them. But to their credit, these two disciples manifested no anger, no uh, animosity towards Jesus. Uh, So they still had a fondness for him. What else did they have? Well, they still believed in him. Well, okay, maybe not to the degree that they had just a few days earlier. I mean, they no longer believed he was the Messiah of Israel. Why? Because he was dead in their minds. Okay? But they still referred to him as a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. So listen, although their faith was damaged, it was not completely destroyed. All right, but what had they lost? That's important. What did they lose in their relationship with the Lord? Well, first of all, they lost hold of the promises that Jesus had given to them. They had forgotten the things he had told them and the promises he had made to them. Listen, heartache will do that. You can be a Christian for 25, 30 years. And I've seen some Christians who go through such heartbreaking loss that it seems they have forgotten everything they have read in God's word over the years, things that he has promised them. Heartache can do that. But here's two things he promised them. There were many others. First of all, three times he had promised them that, yes, he was going to Jerusalem where he would be handed over to evil men who would crucify him. But on the third day, he would rise again from the dead. He promised them that three or four times in the Gospels. Secondly, he promised them that after he rose from the dead and ascended back to his father, He would return to the earth at one point to establish a glorious kingdom, and every eye would see him return. Matthew 24, verse 30, talks about that very thing. And listen, uh, only a resurrected Jesus could fulfill this promise. But it seemed they hadn't taken those promises to heart, or maybe they ignored them altogether. Because Because those things didn't fit into their preconceived ideas of what Messiah would do when he finally came, right? Um, They were taught from the time they were just little boys, the Jewish uh, people, boys and girls, that when Messiah came, he was going to deliver them from the yoke at this time of Roman oppression and establish a glorious kingdom where he would reign over the entire earth from Jerusalem. That's what they believed. That was their faith system. That's what they were looking for, Messiah, when he finally came. They weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to die. And by the way, even though he told them he was going to be crucified three or four times, uh, I think when he said, uh, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be crucified, I think at that point their brains clicked off. You know how we we don't want to hear bad news? So they heard, I'm going to die, and their brains clicked off because they couldn't process that. 
that's not was not part of who they believed Messiah was. They believed the Messiah was going to come and reign in glory, not die on a cross. So I can see why they would possibly um, not listen to anything else he had to say after I'm going to be crucified. It's a classic case of picking and choosing what we want to hear, hear from God's word and, you know, rejecting the rest. And we all tend to do it from time to time. We all tend to do it, not just these two disciples. Christians will often, who have been Christians for a while and do believe in the promises of God, will often lose heart and forget what God has promised when things don't go their way or they experience a catastrophic loss, the loss of a child or a spouse or somebody very near to them. Um, they will often forget the promises of God when things don't work out the way they expected or they've been praying for something and the time frame is such where now it's gotten so long they've been praying, they're giving up hope and so on. And so at that point, the... <clears throat> They immediately forget all the promises that God has given to them, like these two disciples that day. And in the process, guys, they become, and put us all in that category, we sometimes become totally discouraged, defeated, and even depressed, forgetting what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. We have to understand that God has a timetable. You can pray like David, answer me speedily, O Lord, and he may if it suits his timetable. But often uh, it doesn't, and our prayers, are, we're going to just have to keep praying. Didn't Jesus tell us this in Luke 18, verse 1? He said, men, women ought always to pray and not lose heart. Remember what he said in the classic prayer that he taught his disciples? He said, you know, um, he said, uh, ask, seek, and knock. But in the Greek, it's keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and the door will be opened. We have to understand that God doesn't operate according to my timetable. He operates according to his. And so I have to get in line with his timetable and just pray until the answer is either a flat-out no or the time has come for God to work. Listen. God's delays are not always God's denials. God's delays are not. If it's God, tell him I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> and maybe we could silence our telephones. All right. God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. So they, first of all, lost hold of the promises that Jesus had given to them, God. Secondly, they lost hope for the future that Jesus would save them from their present circumstances. Verse 20. Uh, verse 20. So Jesus asked them, why are you guys so sad? Where have you been, stranger? I mean, haven't you known what's going on in the last few days here in Jerusalem? What things? Well, how about the chief priest? Verse 20. And our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. The word redeem means save. We had hoped that this Jesus would have been our Messiah, who would have led us in a, a battle against Rome, overthrown the yoke of Roman oppression, and set us Jews free. You can fill in the blank for whatever it is that you need God to deliver you from. It's just that when we read this, we need to realize how black things can look when we lose hope that God is going to come through. You know, and I've heard people over the years, and it's really silly in this. I don't know if they're just being silly because they're kind of hurt. But, uh, you know, I prayed for a long time for God to work. He had his chance the opportunity's gone. The window is closed. Of I'm like, wait a minute. The window is closed. The, 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 the time of opportunity is over. You're talking about God. God, there's no window of opportunity God has to work, you know, in that little frame of time. He's God. And often he will wait till our resources are completely used up. Because when he works, he wants to get all the glory. He wants to show us that with him, nothing is impossible, right? What about Lazarus? 
who died and was buried for four days. Jesus purposely took his time, right? The girl, the, you know, Mary and Martha sent word to him, come quickly. The one who you love is very sick. He's near death. Come quickly, Lord. He waits a couple of days, two-day journey. By the time he gets to Bethany, Lazarus has been dead and buried for four days. The window of opportunity was closed. No. He called his name, resurrected him, brought him out of the tomb. Why did the Holy Spirit put a story like that in the Bible? A true story, obviously. To show us that God doesn't have uh, to work in a certain way on a certain timetable. Our God is omnipotent. And so when all hope is gone from a human standpoint, when our resources, our avenues are all exhausted, that's when God often says, now it's time for me to work. Because he wants to show us that he can do anything to our God. Nothing shall be impossible. But I will admit, when you have hope for something and you expect it to happen and it keeps dragging on, that's hard. To deal with. Remember what the writer of the Proverbs said in Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, when hope is realized, it is a tree of life. Or in other words, when something we are hoping for doesn't happen quickly. It's delayed in our minds, right? Uh, we become emotionally sick. And that will lead to depression and sometimes, in extreme cases, even suicide. This time of year, around Christmas, more suicides are committed than at any other time of the year. Why is that? Well, because you, people see on TV and everywhere they go, uh, happy people, families around a nice table eating a festive dinner, and maybe they've lost um, ones dear to them. Maybe they grew up in an abusive home. And, and Christmas time has never been a happy time. And now it's only exacerbated by uh, everyone else seeming like they're so full of happiness and joy. It just accentuates the emptiness, the loneliness, and the depression. And some people can't deal. I know alcoholism, uh, alcohol consumption, goes way up around the holidays for a lot of reasons. But for the most part, because people are depressed. Now, alcohol is a depressant. It's not going to help you. You might be double depressed. That's why I think a lot of people commit suicide. They're depressed, and then they drink alcohol, which doubly depresses them, and they can't deal with it. Look, Webster's Dictionary defines hope this way. To desire with expectation of obtainment. That's hope. If there's no, there's no reality of obtaining something you're hoping for, there's no hope there. Humanly speaking, just because we hope for something doesn't mean it's guaranteed, by the way. There are faith teachers on the TV and radio that tell you if you just have enough faith and hope hard enough, you're going to get whatever you want. That's a lie. That's a lie to separate you from your money. These are charlatans. The Bible warns us in many places, be on guard against these people who make merchandise off of God's people with lies and promises that are nothing but, you know, of the devil. There's only, when you're talking about hope from a human standpoint, and we can hope for something out with all our heart, it doesn't mean it's guaranteed. Unless, listen, it's a hope rooted in a promise of God in his word. Those are always sure things. The only issue then is when is God going to bring it to pass? It's as good as done. Our hope, biblical hope, is not an I hope so hope. It's an I know so hope. And all I need to do now is keep trusting God to bring it to pass in his time. In his time. You know, in the Bible, God has given his children many promises, all of which are designed to give us hope for the future. Peter called these exceedingly great and precious promises. Many of these deal with everyday life, of course, where God has uh, promised to provide everything we need to live physically from day to day. I'll read you a couple. You can write these down. I've got a lot of scriptures this morning. Uh, Matthew 6, 
verses 31 to 33. I'll read it to you the NLT. Where Jesus said, talking to his people now, his disciples. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we wear? What will we drink? What will we, excuse me, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need to function on the physical level. Paul said in Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. God shall supply all your needs. It doesn't say he'll give you all your wants. He might do that once in a while. He has been very gracious to me and my family over the years and has given us things that we wanted years ago. It was a good Christmas for the kids. We had no money. I mean, we were just getting by. We entered December, and I knew we had no money to pay bills. The car had died and uh, didn't really have money to pay the rent to pay the mortgage or to buy food and yet here was Christmas coming and so I just prayed an honest prayer I said Lord I know you have not promised to give my kids a nice Christmas I know that nothing in your word says you promised to give presents to my kids I know you'll take care of us with our basic needs but Lord I'm just asking <laughs> would you supply the resources for our kids to have a nice Christmas. And he did that. I mean, and we never asked anybody for anything. That's the thing. You don't pray that prayer and go around and beg your family, feel sorry for you. No, we never did that. And at the end of the month, I looked back, and not only had God paid all the bills and give the kids a great Christmas, uh, he took care of everything else. But he has promised to provide all our needs. And he's always done that through 41 years of ministry. We've never gone without. He's always taken care of us. So guys, God who created us, this is important, knows how important hope is for living our lives here on the earth. And how prone we are to lose it when things get tough. And that is why in his word he constantly tries to encourage us not to lose hope in him or in his promises he has made to us. And he has done this all throughout the Bible. I'll give you just a couple. Um, the first one is maybe one of your life verses, Jeremiah 29, verse 11, where God says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. What is God saying? I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I know things may look a little black right now. Trust me. I'm at work. I know what I'm doing, and I'm working for you to have the most glorious future you can even imagine. But I have to allow certain things to transpire. i got to work in certain ways where it looks pretty black at times, trust me, I know what I'm doing. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then I think Romans 15, verse 13, should be one of these verses you type out and paste on your refrigerator and memorize. It's a prayer from Paul that I think is so apropos for these days we're living in. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, it's the key, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants his people to have hope because he knows it is, it is an essential ingredient for life. He knows that when hope is gone, life becomes unbearable and sometimes even impossible. Uh, I saw an interesting uh, article by you know, psychologist uh, years ago. I guess they have studied somehow, they studied that when a person loses all hope, 
from the time they lose all hope, it's only about seven to eight minutes before they die. Well, how's that possible? They usually take a gun and kill themselves. People cannot live without hope. And that's why God is always trying to encourage us and to infuse within us hope because we're living in a very dark and often hopeless world. And so God says, you're not of the world. You belong to me. I promise I'm going to take care of you. You've got to cling to those promises. But Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. That's not for you to figure out. Just trust me. I'll take care of you. Just look to me. Cling to my promises. So, they had lost hold of the promises that Jesus had given them, first of all. Secondly, they had lost hope for the future that Jesus would save them from their present circumstances, which was, in their case, Roman oppression. Number three, let's just talk, call this the general one. They lost sight of Jesus because of the, of the circumstance. Look at verse 15. So it was while they conversed and reasoned, these two disciples, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Guys, once we begin to lose our faith, our spiritual vision grows dim. And we get very nearsighted. What do I mean? Well, at that point, we only see the, see the size of our problem and not the size of our God. We've always, in the past, used the illustration of putting your hand so close to your eyes that you blot out the sun, which is, I don't know how many, you know, Miles in diameter. I'm going to look it up. I forgot. You can look it up. Not now. Um, but you know how big the sun is. Now, you can block out the sun, something as big as the sun, with your hand if you get your hand close enough to your eyes. If you get your problem, your eyes close enough to your problem, whatever that problem may be, you're going to block out your God who is bigger than the sun many, many, infinitely times over. But Christians do it all the time. They get so consumed with the problem, they lose sight of their God. And that's something we have to always be on guard against because when that happens, well, we no longer see things through the eyes of faith, but now only through the eyes of flesh. It's like Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee. Remember the, the storm? And uh, Jesus came to the disciples. They were uh, struggling in the, in the boat uh, in this storm. And uh, Peter says, if it's really, they thought he was a goat. Peter said, if it's really, you let me walk to you on the water, right? So P Jesus come. Peter steps out of the boat, begins to walk on water. Well, that's a pretty spectacular thing to experience, right? But he realized pretty quickly, what am I doing? I'm walking on water. I can't walk on water. He's looking at the size of the waves and the storm. He took his eyes off of Jesus and immediately he began to sink. Prayed a simple prayer because you don't have time for a big flowery prayer at that point. Lord, save me. Jesus reached out and saved him. He said, why did you doubt, O ye of little faith? Peter sunk because he got his eyes off of the Lord and onto his circumstances, and that's exactly what happens to us. Same thing. What else did these guys lose? Well, they lost their joy. That's pretty obvious. Verse 17. Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad guys some christians are sad as they walk with jesus just like these two and even though the lord was walking with them these two disciples as he is walking with us by the way um, these two disciples couldn't see him their eyes were blinded by sorrow and loss and shattered dreams it reminds us of mary magdalene outside the tomb that Resurrection Sunday morning weeping. I mean, here the risen Christ was standing there trying to encourage her, but her eyes were blinded, again, by sorrow and loss and shattered dreams, just like it's true of us sometimes. I mean, Jesus said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yet we feel very alone at, at points in our lives because we feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're going through this alone, that Jesus is abandon us in our minds. The devil tells us that, that God's abandoned us. That's a lie. He said, I'll never abandon you. But we let the circumstance get so blown out of proportion in our minds that we begin to think that we're on our own, that God has abandoned us. And when that happens, um, well, you know, our joy is gone. 
And now sadness fills our hearts. And that should be, that's kind of a, an oxymoron for a Christian. Uh, a Christian should never really be sad. Now that's ideal, the ideal. Christians should never worry. Christians should never really be sad. I mean, we have all these great and precious promises. Why aren't we just focusing on the Lord and trusting in Him, right? Let me give you one more thing they lost. They lost their fire. Look at verse 21. But we were hoping. We were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Guys, in other words, their spiritual passion was gone. Their fire had gone out. Jesus put it this way to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. He said, you have left your first love. Notice, he didn't say you have lost your first love. He said you have left it. We don't lose our honeymoon love for Jesus. We walk away from it. That's why Jesus had to come walking to these guys. We walk away from him. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a commitment he has made to us, a commitment he fully keeps. But you can walk a million miles away from Jesus over the course of your life. You can be a Christian and go through some tragedy and you turn against God and you walk a million miles away from him the, the day you say, I need to get back to God and you turn around you'll find he's right there he has never left you he's always been with you but Jesus said to the church of Ephesus you are you're still going through the motions but you've lost the emotion in your relationship with me it's a lot of Christians who are still going through the motions but they have no emotion in their heart for Jesus the fire has gone out and all of this is a picture of many in the church today. Um, many people have suffered bitter losses or disappointments. And so like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, let me list some of the things that they're experiencing. They still have a fondness for Jesus, although they speak of, him, of their relationship with him often in the past tense because nothing much is happening with the Lord in their life today. They still believe in him somewhat. Their faith is severely damaged, but not totally destroyed. They're not atheists. They haven't renounced their faith and walked away and gotten back into the world, and now we're atheists. They've lost hold of the promises that God has given to them in his word. They've lost hope that God is ever going to work and that things are ever going to change. Again, you fill in the blanks. The blank. Their spiritual vision has grown dim. They can't see the Lord is with them and still working in their lives. They've lost their joy, and they've lost their passion for God. All right, well, how did Jesus deal with these two disciples? Because the way he dealt with them, guys, is the way he's going to deal with us. That's why the Holy Spirit put this story in the Word. How Jesus dealt with these two disciples is how he's going to deal with us. So how did Jesus deal with them? Well, first of all, he comes to them. They had walked away from him. He comes to them. Verse 15. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. It seems that Jesus spent most of that afternoon with them, talking to them, teaching them, ministering to them, trying to encourage them, even though neither of them were of any great importance. You say, what do you mean? Well, they were just ordinary disciples. They weren't apostles. They weren't big shots in the faith. But see, that's the fallacy. Something we need to understand. Jesus is no respecter of persons. He has no ordinary disciples. We're all special to him. I mean, he cares about you and what you're going through. And Peter affirmed that in his first epistle by saying that um, cast all your cares upon Jesus. The Greek word is anxieties, worries. Cast all your anxieties upon Jesus, for he cares about you. I mean, guys, he knows if you're having a crisis of faith right now. And I believe he'll come to you in some way, shape, or form to encourage you if you're looking for him. 
if you're looking for him. Uh, maybe he'll come to you through a circumstance like he did with Peter and the guys on the Sea of Galilee, uh, caught in this storm. That was quite a trial. And in the midst of the storm, Jesus comes to them. Jesus, I'm convinced that the reason God allows storms in our lives, trials and different adversities, is because he wants us to draw near to him. He wants to come to us in a way we never thought possible. Here's John, 90 years old, uh, cast onto the, isle, the uh, island of Patmos, Isle of Patmos, out in the Aegean Sea, a rock that juts out of the Aegean Sea. Penal colony for the Romans. And here they cast John into this God-forsaken environment. But it was on the Isle of Patmos that Jesus Christ came to him, appeared to him, and gave him the greatest revelation in the Bible, the book of Revelation. We have to understand something, that when adversity comes our way, if you get bitter and angry and you renounce God and you walk away from him, you're going to miss the lesson. You're going to miss what he's trying to do which is not to hurt you, is to build you. He might come to you in a crisis or a storm of some kind. Uh, he may come to you in a, through a verse or a passage that you're reading in your morning devotions. How many times have you opened your Bible and started reading, and all of a sudden there was a verse that was like exactly what you needed for the moment? Sometimes he'll come to you through another Christian. Have you ever had the experience where all of a sudden you get a text from somebody you know in the church and they, were, and they say to you, well, uh, in my devotions this morning, God put you on my heart and told me to give you this scripture. And they sent it to you. And it's exactly what you needed. Jesus has just come to you through another believer. Maybe he'll come to you through somebody you don't know. What do I mean? Well, you can be taking the train into work one morning, consumed with some problem in your life. And all of a sudden, two people in the seats behind you are talking. You can't help but overhear. It's obvious that they're Christians. And as one begins to tell the other what they're going through or what they had gone through that God delivered them from, you're thinking, that's exactly what I'm going through. And then they begin to share how God brought them through it. And here's some scriptures he gave me. Jesus has just come to you through people you don't even know. It's really Jesus. It really is. Because Jesus is in all believers through his Holy Spirit. But if you're not careful, even though he comes to you, you may miss him. I'll let you read Mark 6 this week. Again, how the disciples were in the boat trying to cross the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was on the mountain praying. And here they were struggling for six to eight hours trying to get across. At one point, when they thought all hope was gone, they were going to go under, they were, they, were, they were goners. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. It's interesting that Mark points out these guys were so consumed with the storm, with the problem, that Jesus almost walked right by them. I'm wondering how many times Jesus has walked past me because I've been so busy struggling with the problem. I'm not looking for him to come to me and teach me. Something to think about. He comes to them. Number two, he reproves them for not understanding all that God had said in his word. Listen, about the Messiah. That would be prophecy, by the way. There's a lot of churches that don't teach prophecy because it offends people, it makes them uncomfortable, and it's all about keeping people in the seats so that they keep giving to the church. But guys, the Bible contains 27% prophecy. If you don't teach prophecy, you're teaching not teaching over a quarter of God's word. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 4, verse 4? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by 75% of the word of God? No. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Listen to what he says here. Verse 25 and 6. Then he said to them, he reproves them. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Listen, 
Jesus is not reproving them because they hadn't memorized the, their scriptures completely. He was not coming down on them because they didn't memorize some obscure passage from Amos or Hosea. He's coming down on them because they, they did not understand the basics about the Messiah. Why didn't they understand the basics about the Messiah? Uh, didn't they have the scriptures? Of course they did. But you have to understand, as Jesus points out, they did not believe all, all that the prophets had written about the Messiah. That was the problem with most of the Jews in Jesus' day. They saw Messiah as a conquering Savior, saved them from Rome, but not as a suffering servant. And you know how it goes? Human nature is to gravitate to the positive things. We see it today. There's a lot of Christians who will only focus on the promises that are good. That promise, you know, if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. That one never makes it into the promise books that you can buy in the Christian store, right? It's always the positive stuff, the uplifting stuff. And that's how a lot of people approach the scriptures. Um, you know, as we have said, kind of like you approach the salad bar at the local sizzler. You just pick and choose what you like and leave the rest there, you know? And that's how people approach the scriptures. They often just pick and choose the stuff they like and leave all the bad stuff, the judgment, um, all the stuff where God tells them that they must live a life of holiness and obedience if he's going to really bless them and so on, right? Um, you know, a lot of Christians today have been pumped so full of word of faith, garbage teaching. That all they can see is how rich they're going to be, how big the house they're going to have, how successful their business. Many Christians today want blessing but not adversity. They reject the cross but still want the crown, right? Forgetting that crucifixion Friday precedes resurrection Sunday. They want the power of the resurrection. They just don't want the fellowship of his suffering when it comes to the cross. Even though Paul reminded us in Philippians 1.29, for you it has been granted, you Christians, it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but listen, also to suffer for his sake. That's a promise. So he comes to them, he reproves them because the way they approached the scripture was so shallow and self-serving. Don't do that. And then what does he do? He teaches them properly from the word of God. Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Paul admonished the Ephesian elders uh, in Acts 20, 27 to teach their people the whole counsel of God. That is why we teach verse by verse here at Calvary. That way we're going to cover the whole counsel of God. I'm not against topical teaching. If it's done in the context of expositional teaching, as we have gone through John verse by verse, we come to passages that we camp on and develop as a topical study, and then we move on again verse by verse. If you go to a church that only teaches topically, I'm not saying that can't be a blessing, but you're not going to get the whole counsel of God. You have to go through it verse by verse if you're going to get the whole counsel of God. And I know at this point, some are thinking to themselves, but wait a minute, I'm always studying the Bible. And my heart still feels cold. You're talking about the Bible, the Bible. Well, I study the Bible all the time. My heart still feels cold. Okay, I know that can be true. But do you study the Bible to learn about Jesus? Now, listen to this. Do you study the Bible to learn about Jesus? In other words, do you want to understand and draw close to Jesus through the study of the Word? Or do you study to increase your knowledge of the Bible? Because it makes you feel better about yourself as a Christian. I know Christians who love God with all their mind, but not so much their heart, soul, and strength. They pride themselves on their intellectual approach to the Bible. And they will quote doctrine all day long. 
They sit in coffee shops. I've known some. And all day they discuss doctrine. When you see them out in the real world, though, they don't act very loving to others. Got a lot of head knowledge. But knowledge puffs up. Love does what? Builds up. Remember, Jesus said in Psalm 40, verse 7, quoted by Paul in Hebrews 10, verse 7, the volume of the book is written of me. The Bible is written of me, right? He said to the Pharisees in John 5, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. It is they that testify of me, but you refuse to come to me, that I might give you this life. And so verse 27, he expounded to these disciples, In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. I just want, as we bring this to a close, I want you to notice something. And if you don't remember anything else, remember this. The fire was not kindled in the hearts of these two disciples while they walked together on the road and talked about Jesus. Christians gather all the time for different reasons, and we fellowship with each other, and often Jesus is the topic of conversation. And we think something deeply spiritual has taken place because we have spent two hours or three hours at a Christian gathering, and we've talked about Jesus. I want you to notice that these two guys were walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a walk that took them at least three hours, and they spent all that time talking about Jesus. But listen, the fire was not kindled in their hearts until they began spending time with Jesus and talking to him and he to them through his word. Guys, we can only really know him. When I say no, I mean using no in the deepest way possible. We can only know Jesus deeply and intimately when we commune with him. Look at verse 35. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. They sat down to have a meal together. They broke bread. In that culture, when you ate with somebody, you broke bread, you were sustained by the same loaf of bread, you dipped it into the same sauces and gravies, they believed that you were becoming one with that person. It was a, an act of communion together. I want you to notice the Holy Spirit points out that Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread, which we could say spiritually represents communion that we celebrate once a month, which signifies our oneness with Jesus. You can talk about Jesus till you're blue in the face and never grow, never experience the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying it's bad to talk about Jesus. If you want power, you want your life to be transformed, you've got to commune with Jesus through the Word and through prayer. All right, we're done, but quickly, what was the results in these disciples' lives? Well, first of all, verse 32 tells us their hearts were rekindled for God. And they said to one another, did not our heart, our heart burn within us when he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, let, let me just say this to you. You're never going to find a more spirit-filled, dynamic preacher and teacher than Jesus, obviously, right? But if a church wants to have Christians whose hearts are on fire for the Lord, they need to have preachers, teachers that are spirit-filled that love the word, that honor the word, that believe it is the word of God in its totality, and they teach it without apology. The good, the bad, everything else. I'm not going to just focus on the verses that are a blessing. I'm going to focus on the verses that pinch a little bit, you know, that are not so pleasant, that, that point out things that I'm not really doing right. I'm not living for God properly. Not to condemn, but to help you to grow. So when we talk about hearts that are burning for the Lord, it starts with a church that honors God's word and pastors and elders that teach God's word 
in its entirety in the power of the Spirit because only then will hearts be pierced and lives changed. That's all there is to it. And then secondly, their hearts were rekindled, first of all. Secondly, they had a burning passion to tell others about the risen Lord Jesus. Are you afraid to evangelize? Draw close to Jesus. He will fill you to overflowing with the Spirit. And it's just going to happen. It's just going to happen. Your heart for the lost will just intensify. Look at verse 33. So they rose up that very hour. Now it's late. They had dinner together, right? And they returned to Jerusalem. That was like a three-hour walk. It's dark. You're wearing primitive sandals, rugged roads. At least three or four hours. They were so filled, though, the fire of God had so filled their hearts, they couldn't wait to go back to Jerusalem and share with the others about how they had seen the risen Christ. From that hour they returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them and, and uh, them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed. If you have time this week, you might want to look at Jeremiah 23. That chapter primarily is God putting down false teachers. I didn't send them, but they ran. I didn't tell them to say anything, but they spoke. They lie to you. They, 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 you know, they, they tell you that things are great when I've told you your lives are not being lived for me and judgment is coming. They put a Band-Aid on cancer, basically, making people feel like they've healed them. But in the midst of that, he says in verses 28 and 9, the prophet, the false prophet, who goes around sh telling his dreams. Hey, let them tell their dreams to each other. But he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word, listen, like a fire and like a hammer that breaks the hardness of any heart in pieces? Only spirit-filled preaching from God's word can set a heart on fire and break up the fallow ground so that people are ready to really understand and walk with God the way God wants them to. Let me just say this, we'll close. Once God lights a fire in our hearts, we need to keep stoking that fire and feeding it every day. This is the secret to having ongoing hearts on fire for God. It starts off by believing in Jesus and receiving him into your heart as your Savior by faith. That's where the fire is kindled. But it needs to be fed by spending time with Jesus in his word and in prayer every day. Guys, this is Christianity 101. This is not deep, profound truths that you're never going to hear anywhere else. This is very basic Christianity. You want a heart on fire for God, you got to receive Christ as your Savior. And not just receive him with your head, commit your heart to him with your whole life. And let Jesus take control. And may you be consumed with a desire to walk with him, to, to, to know him by spending time in the word, in prayer. It's not rocket science. It's as basic as it gets. I mean, Christians come to me and say, I don't know what's wrong with my walk. I, my heart is so, I feel so weak. I tell them, what if you had, hadn't eaten in a few days? What if you hadn't eaten for three or four days? You think you'd be weak? Physically? Sure. Are you feeding yourself spiritually? I get people leaving Bibles here, and we keep them thinking that they'll give us a phone call and say, hey, did I leave my Bible there? I was looking for it for my devotions on Monday morning. I've had Bibles sit here for six, eight months. We finally give them away to the uh, used bookstore. I won't throw a Bible away. We just bring them in and give, them, give, give the Bible away. And I'm thinking, how does a person survive without the word? No wonder you're weak. No wonder there's no fruit. No wonder you're depressed. And there's no joy. And there's no fire. It's not rocket science. 
Get close to Jesus. Keep that word close to you and read it every single day. And may God give us the fire of his spirit to fall upon us in these last days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even when our hearts grow cold, you want to come to us and rekindle that fire. And we ask that you would do that with every heart in this place. That, Lord, if our hearts have grown cold, it's because we have walked away from you, not because you, uh, you have walked away from us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, Lord, give us grace to turn, because when we do turn, we'll realize you're right there. And we just want our hearts to be on fire again. We want our passion for you to fill our hearts and that desire to tell others about you, Lord, work in us um, in a way that we can't even imagine right now. That we would be people on fire for your kingdom, for your, for your word and so on. Lord, we thank you. We ask you to keep blessing these studies in your word. We ask all this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Is anyone here this morning who has not received Jesus into your heart as your Savior? And you'd like to know more about what that actually means, come on up here so we can talk with you, pray with you. We'd love to do that so you can receive him into your heart. I guarantee you'll never know Christmas like when Jesus lives in your heart. All right. Uh, and that reminds me this week, uh, Wednesday we do, uh, we'll have church, we will uh, finish the second part of a two-part uh, two message on the story of Christmas, so come out Wednesday. Christmas morning, we have a dynamic young preacher preaching for us. He just happens to have my name. He's my oldest son. He's coming in with his family this week, and he said, Dad, I really feel God has laid a, a Christmas message on my heart. What do you think if I gave it that Sunday morning? I said, Son... God has really not laid anything on my heart except what we already know uh, about Christmas. And I said, you know, if God has laid something on your heart that heavily, come on out and share it with us. So pray for him and uh, come on back Christmas morning at 12. Only 12. One service. God bless you guys. Have a great week.